Hi there, my friend and friends. There were a lot of amazing things that were added to CSS this year. And actually, while I was recording and researching for this video, I just kept coming across things and being like, oh yeah, that was added this year. Or wow, this feature has better browser support than I thought it would. And I can't lie, it's a really good time to have a YouTube channel that's dedicated to CSS. Now, I'm making this video because I'm always asked about how I keep up with all of the new features that are coming to CSS. So I figured this would be a nice way to highlight a lot of the new things for everyone to look forward to as we move into the next year and also highlight some features that might have better browser support than you might realize. As we dive into this, I just want to say that it is very possible that I do miss a few features along the way here. But if I do miss any of the ones that you're excited about, please let me know in the comments so that I can highlight them the next time I do one of these updates. Because going forward, I'd like to do one of these updates probably every quarter as long as there's enough to talk about each one. Uh, and I think there will be just because of how fast CSS is expanding and growing. Also, any of the browser support numbers that I do are at the time of recording this. Uh, so you can check the date when this was published. And they're all based on can I use as global numbers. Uh, if you have access to your own site's analytics, those are always the best things to check. And if you're watching this, at any point in the future, you might want to check what the actual browser support numbers are using can I use. And we might as well finally jump into the first thing that I want to talk about, which is nesting, which first gained support in Chrome in April of this year and has since gained support from both Safari and Firefox as well. Nesting allows us to, well, nest selectors inside of other ones like we've always been able to do with preprocessors like SAS and LESS, but there are a few little differences between them, but some of those differences are actually being reduced because there is a new more relaxed syntax that only Firefox uh, supports right now, but that is on the way for both Safari and Chrome as well. And if you don't know what nesting is at all, you can see right here, the, don't worry about my grid template columns and rows, but you can see here I have this hero grid and inside of there I have a nested media query with all the styles I want for that. And then even in here I have this button selector and my page title selector that are nested within my hero text. Uh, the syntax highlighting is a little bit off just because VS Code, maybe there's something I could add here uh, that would help out. I'm not sure. <laughs> I haven't looked, but uh, I'm, I'm fine with it not looking fantastic. But the main thing is it's just really nice to do and I love being able to nest media queries. It's by far the, my favorite thing. So I don't have to put my hero grid again. I can just put the media query and keep going from there. And for me, I think one of the most exciting things about nesting is we have a feature that was added first just this past April and it's already supported by the three browser engines and it currently has over 80% support when we use the original syntax. Uh, which is absolutely just wild. And if you use the the current syntax or the, the original syntax of it, and you know, as the browsers gain support for the newer syntax, the older stuff still works. It's just it's less strict than it used to be. Um, I'm not going to dive into it too much in this one. You can look into it a bit uh, if you want to know the difference between the two. Um, but it basically, you can just do an element selector nested without a symbol in front of it going forward. And moving on to another feature that has even better browser support is the has pseudo selector, I think is what we call it, uh, which is coming in at a shade under 90% support. And the main reason I actually wanted to talk about this, because it's been around for a little while, it wasn't introduced this year, but Firefox is finally getting support for it with version 121. Uh, and I love has so much. It opens up so many new things that were never possible before in CSS. Uh, just really fast here is like one example that I like to look at. Here I have my, my cards uh, and I might have this media inside of it, but like normally my card, actually I don't think I need that here. Normally my card would have some padding on it. And so I, what I could do is if my card, uh, let's go find it. If my card has a dot media, we're going over to a display grid and setting up two columns. And the rest of the time we don't have that. And other things too, you can play with your padding depending on stuff. But you know, we're saying if my card has this as a child or not even a direct child, but if it has this media thing in here, then we're just gonna say, okay, now we're changing how this element is working so great uh, and there's so many really other awesome stuff you can do with it i've covered this in videos before i'll link to those in the description and most of the things i'm talking about in this video i have done videos on so if there's something you do want to learn more about check the description and you should find a link uh, either to a video I've done, and if I don't have a video, I'll link off to another resource instead. Yeah, it's really exciting to see how uh, with has being in all three browsers now, and it's just sort of gradually inching up higher and higher in the browser support tables. Really, really awesome to see. 
Uh, but up next, we're going to look at another one, which is Text Wrap Balance, which was first added to Chrome in May of this year and quickly followed by Safari in June. Sadly, Firefox doesn't actually support it yet, but it's a very nice progressive enhancement as it's primarily to prevent um, like issues in our text. Or actually, let's just take a look because I think it'd be easier to explain. Uh, so here we have this where you can see that this is uh, a demo by the Chrome for Developers blog they put together, uh, which is nice and handy. Uh, and here we have the on balance text and here is with the balance text. So it's mostly for headlines or headings, uh, short bits of text. I think it only works if you have two to three lines of text and after that it has no impact, uh, but it just balances text out to prevent the bottom, you know, for having two lines on a headline that are on balanced. Uh, and you know, if a browser doesn't support it, they just get this version. So nothing breaks. It just, it might look a little bit nicer if you're on a browser that does support it. And the one that's maybe a little bit more exciting here is text wrap pretty, which also by the same team, uh, they have another demo here where this is for longer pieces of text, your paragraphs where you go three or more lines long, uh, where sometimes we get orphans and an orphan in typography is just when you get this lonely little one single short word all by itself on its lo lonesome down there. Uh, and if we turn on pretty balancing, it just prevents an orphan from being there. Uh, so nice and handy. Uh, it won't be like perfect. It's not going to do the balancing. So the line will get super short to try and, you know, balance everything out the same way here where it makes a pretty big difference at times. Uh, it's just going to make sure that there's no single word sitting all on its lonesome at the end of a paragraph. Now this is only supported by Chrome, which only landed in version 117, uh, but it, I think it does a nice job. And once again, it's a really nice progressive enhancement. And as more browsers get support for it, you'll just have more and more users getting a slightly nicer experience. So it's just one of those sort of like things you can throw in there as part of a reset. It's going to work and you don't really have to worry about it too much after that. And slowly over time, more and more people will get that better experience. Next up, we're going to talk a little bit about color mix, which is I'm going to count it as a new feature for 2023, even though Safari started supporting it back in 2022, because it only gained support about halfway through December of that year in Safari. And it was followed by Chrome adding it in March and Firefox adding it in May. And now with all three browser engines having support for it, Color Mix is already at about 85% support, which is incredible for such a new feature and just a really fast look at how this one works. Uh, it's basically, you can mix two colors. I have a purple here and a cyan here, and then my one in the middle. I'm just doing a color mix and I'm mixing my color one and my color two. And now there are a few things uh, that are a little bit strange, but you have to, you do have to choose what color mode you're mixing with. And that will actually change the result as you can see there. Uh, and there is a shorter and longer thing that's even a little bit different. So here, if I did, uh, <laughs> if I switch shorter to longer, uh, we'll see that I think, yeah, we go the other way around the circle. Anyway, the, it can be a little bit funky, but it's actually a really powerful feature that can be really useful for color schemes and everything. So definitely worth checking out. And while we're on the topic of colors, and here I put in LCH, both Lab and LCH gained support in Safari way back in September of 2021, but they only landed in Chrome and Firefox this year. And LCH here is for lightness, chroma and hue. And because hue is one of the things here, one of the ones that we can play with, uh, it's a little bit similar to HSL where it's easy to know what color you're getting, but it has the added benefit where it lines up better with human perception. And so if I go with this like sort of washed out yellow, I think it's a nice example because as I go through the hue here, you can see it's always sort of like the same we're getting a few fallbacks, but don't worry, but we're, we're getting sort of the same level of color, if you want to say, whereas if I compare that to HSL, which is right here, um, if I'm, and here's the final output. So let's get a really saturated color. And as we go through here, like the blue is actually kind of dark. And then as we go into this, like that's really bright, yellows tend to be really, really bright. And then as soon as you get to the orange, it's sort of darker again. So LCH in terms of just shifting through the hue gives you much uh, more uniform results. And it's much more, as I said, in line with human perception. The problem with uh, LCH is it's a little bit weird to use because uh, you have to deal with the chroma. And there's it has to do with how color models work um, and you know where the what colors are actually available to see <laughs> um, and what our monitors can actually output. But let's say I go into like a very high lightness. So we're going bright. I can actually get into like this really bright green over here. So, here, you know, uh, let's go right there. I get this really bright, we can even go a bit more, 
this way. There we go. I can get this like super vibrant, really bright green. But the problem is I have a really small window where I have this lightness chroma. Uh, yeah, this lightness and chroma that are available because as soon as I go out of that, like there, there is no greens. And like if I go into the blues, they don't exist within this color model. So it, all of a sudden that hue that was really easy to follow, it becomes a little bit trickier because <laughs> I just don't have a blue in there. And then the opposite is I go darker, my blues, uh, and we actually darker, not darker. Is it darker? I see this is well here as I'm going through the lightness, you can see the chroma. That's what I was thinking. But as I go through the lightness, the chroma shifts and it's more the purples I was thinking. Um, so here the purples in this area has this like huge range of chroma available that's only in a few of the different colors and or hues and, and stuff. So you can see it, it's a little bit weird in that sense um, and definitely takes a little bit of playing around with maybe to get the colors you want. And I was hoping it would be easier to use. There's definitely some tricks to LCH, but I'm still really happy that we have it because it actually does open up more colors than are available uh, if, than if you're using HSL and RGB. The other thing is you have LCH and OK LCH. And I would actually recommend using the OK LCH version. You're just gonna get a little bit more consistency with your colors uh, and everything along the way. So just there is those two. And you also have the lab, as I said, you probably aren't gonna use that so much for actually writing in colors, but you might use it for when you're doing color mixes and you're uh, mixing two colors, you might be mixing it using lab or something like that. And continuing on our trend of color functions that Safari was the first to add, we have relative colors as well, which was only added in Safari in March of this year, followed by Chrome just last month. And well, we're still waiting on Firefox for this one. And I won't lie, this one looks really strange. You can see here, I have uh, some CSS looking at it, uh, but it's really cool <laughs> because what we can do is we can take a color and then I can choose something like HSL or RGB and I can actually change parts of it. So I'm saying I want my color from, so we're basing it on steel blue, but I'm taking my H, my S, my L, and then, you know, maybe I need it to be transparent. I just do a point uh, five here and then I'm getting the 50% opacity on that color even though it's steel blue, which is just a keyword. Cool, right? Uh, and this could be anything. This could be an HSL, an RGB, a lab, whatever you want. Any color could be here. But then the next thing that's cool is I can also play around with these. So I could say calc and I could just say, I want my hue to be plus 100. And then it changes my hue. It adds 100 to the hue that was steel blue if steel blue is an HSL. Or I can go to my saturation I can do calc. And on the calc here, let's say times 1.5 and it will become more saturated. Or I can say times 0.5 and it's gonna become less saturated. So this one definitely opens up a lot of possibilities, but because it's not in Firefox yet and because Chrome just added it, support for it is below 50% right now. But with Chrome having added it in, it should go up pretty fast from here. Now moving on to a feature that people were asking about for a really long time, we have container queries, which are about to hit 90% support. And that also means they are in all of our browsers as well. So let's take a look at this one. I'm gonna jump on over uh, to this demo that I have set up. And you can see this sidebar here where I have these items that are stacked on top of each other. As this gets narrower, at one point, it runs out of room and it jumps underneath here. And when it goes down below, it has a lot more room and they stack one next to, or don't stack, they go one next to each other instead of being stacked. And then as we continue to go smaller in space, everything stacks once again. And this is all happening because I'm using a container query. So if I come and I take a look in here, let's zoom way in on my dev tools. I have this container that's set up around there. And then if I take a look at my uh, OL that's right here, it just has this display of grid uh, right there. But as we get more room for it, you can see I have my at container coming in. So when the container, so in this element, the parent of my OL has a width of 35 or bigger, I get my grid template columns coming in and it gives me three columns. And what's nice about this is I'm not worrying about the viewport. I'm worried about how much room this OL has to live in. So if we go even bigger once again, now even though we're at a larger viewport, these are going and stacking again here because the parent doesn't have a lot of room. If I was doing this with a media query, I'd need one to say at this large screen size, I need them to stack. Then I would need to worry about where my breakpoint is for this to switch, match that breakpoint to make it go to three columns, and then also come down and match whatever breakpoint this is 
to make it go back to the way it was before. And now I don't have to worry about any of that. I just say, if it has enough room, then it goes next to each other. If it doesn't have enough room, it stacks and that's it. It's wonderful. And this is just like a really simple example. Container queries are something we waited for for a long time. Everyone was excited they're here and we can see why they're just, they're gonna make our lives so much easier going forward. And another feature that has even better browser support than that is Cascade Layers, which now have over 93% support at the time of recording this. Uh, and these allow us to create layers within our CSS and you, you add layer right there. Uh, and this isn't something I've actually used a ton of, even though I have done a demo or a video here on YouTube about them. Uh, and it's just because I haven't really had a huge need for them, but I do see their usefulness. And now that support is getting better, it might be something that I actually do start looking into a little bit more going forward. And I recently did a survey and from the results of that, one of the biggest complaints with CSS that people had was project maintenance. And if that's the same for you, you might wanna look into how layers work because just as an example here, uh, I have these components that are set up. So my layer of components, if you see here, I have my layout and then I have my components coming after that. And so if I come and I look at my component uh, right here, I have my background set and my color set right here. And this button, if we come and look at my HTML is right here and it's a link within uh, right here, right? I have these two links that are inside of my UL, which are in my nav list. This is just a dot button. If I come down into my layout now, I have this really high specificity selector changing the color of my links because I wanted those links to be this green color that we can see right here. Normally, if we weren't using layers or if I changed, let's just change the order of these, I can take layout off from here and put layout afterward, which makes it more higher specificity. You can see I've lost the text. Uh, the text is still there. It's just now that, you know, now that this selector is overwriting it. So it's getting the color of lime green as my text color. So this is, so if we go back, now we have, even though this is a lower specificity selector and this is a really high specificity selector, this one is winning because it's on what's considered the more important layer. So this could be a really nice way to deal with project maintenance and not having to worry so much about specificity uh, as much because you group things, you have your reset, maybe a framework, your base layer, your layout, your utilities, you organize them in the order that you want them to work. And then they're just gonna work every time. Your utilities could even be element selectors. It doesn't really make sense, but if they were element selectors, they would overwrite ID selectors coming from your components. So it could be a nice way to improve the maintenance of your projects without having to worry so much about how other people are authoring their CSS as long as they're organizing it in the correct layer. And now let's go on to the next one, which is one that we're gonna throw in here, even though it gained support way back in March of 2022, uh, which is the CSS trigonomic functions. And it was Safari, once again, that added them way back then, but Chrome and Firefox only got around to them in March of this year. But with all three of them on board, they're already at over 88% support right now. And I'm really not much of a math person at all, but I've looked at them before. I see how they can be really useful. Uh, and other people that are much better at math, like Anna Tudor, who put this video together, uh, highlights some of the amazing things we can do where all of the animation stuff that's happening here that used to have to rely on JavaScript, now we can do with CSS. We're just basically updating a couple of things here in the JavaScript, but all of the styling stuff uh, is done with CSS using trig. If you need circles and animations around circles or anything like that, uh, it's, it's exactly what you're looking for. And if you know about how these things work better than I do, you can probably already think of other things that they could be useful for as well. And as we go through all of these uh, things, if you'd like to keep up with CSS, but you'd like to do so on a more regular schedule than waiting for me to put out one of these videos every now and then, I do also have a weekly newsletter where I share general advice as well as resources and interesting sites that I come across every week and also what I've been up to each week as well. And if you don't want any other emails in your inbox, you can also get it as a podcast, or if you prefer video, you can get the same content over on my second YouTube channel. You can find links to all of those in the description below. But back to the update, uh, there's no way I could go through an update like this one without talking about Subgrid. I've already made five videos on them, and four of those videos I actually made in 2021. I've been championing for Subgrid for so long now, basically 
basically ever since Firefox gained support for it back in 2019. So it feels a little bit funny to be doing a new features list for something that a browser supported for four years now, but it only gained support within Safari in the middle of last year, and it only landed in Chrome in September of this year. It's super frustrating that it took this long, but better late than never. It does have only about 79% support right now, thanks to Chrome adopting it so recently, but it should rise quickly from here. And once again, uh, for a quick demo, I actually used Subgrid on this part of the same one. We, we was doing a lot of new features here uh, on this one. And once again, in the dev tools, if I move my face out of the way, you can see that we have a grid set up and then I have a subgrid set up. And the reason I wanted to have a subgrid here is because I wanted this text to live across these two columns of the main grid, but I didn't want this one to go outside of this part here. And I could have done this without subgrid by having just not bothering with this hero text. The problem then is you're sort of getting all of these extra rows that are being created on the main grid that I didn't want. I, did, I wanted one row on my main grid uh, so I just wanted a text box in there, but then I needed this text to go out. I didn't want to muck around with negative margins or weird stuff or having to come on this one and add a margin to it or something. I just wanted that, you know, my button and my text here to fit the first column and this text to go across too. And with subgrid, I just tell the parent that you're going across two columns and this text goes on two and then this one goes on one and it just works. It's, it's fabulous. Uh, and I, there's a lot of really good use cases for subgrid. This one, once again, is a simple one, but if you want to know more, as I said, I've done several videos on them and you can check for the links in the description uh, to find out more because I'm in love with subgrid. I'm so happy it's finally here. And moving on to the next one, it's actually something I've been keeping a close eye on for a really long time now. And I actually do have a bit of content planned around it as well, which should be coming out really soon, either just before this or just after this video, uh, which is view transitions. Now, sadly, view transitions are only in Chrome right now, having been added in March of this year, but it also goes to show you the dominance that Chrome has on the market as it already has over 66% browser support. And there's actually two different parts to view transitions. One of them that's the currently supported thing by Chrome at the moment is for making it easy to transition things when you update your DOM on a single page. So you have a bit of JavaScript, make a change, you know, you click a button, you update the DOM, and then you can just have a transition from the old state to the new state super simply. The more impressive thing though, which is only behind a flag in Chrome right now, allows for transitions between pages, making multi-page sites feel like single page apps. And Astro has actually completely leaned into this in a very big way. And I absolutely love this demo that they put together for it. So not only have they leaned into it, but they've also built in, um, you know, a polyfill into the system. So even though I don't have it enabled in my flags right now, it works. And so this is a multi-page site. <laughs> you can see that this image, if I go back, the image, you know, I click this one, the image transitions over. Isn't that just amazing? And this is a multi-page site as I go through these. If it's playing, what if I go back? And it's still playing down here at the bottom as well. Um, not sure how the music part of it down here works, but just this transition is so nice. They've put together several demos. This one's like a really simple one, but it just shows that you can have something animate across, it makes it feel much more just amazing. And you can do other transitions than this. You can just have the whole page fade, like cross fade from one thing to the other. Uh, but it's all the ones where like the, the titles and other stuff like move from one place to the other that makes it feel much more just immersive and much more like an SPA uh, and something I'm really looking forward to gaining more browser support. And sticking with animation related things, I recently took a look at how we can use the new animation timeline with the scroll function to make a CSS only parallax, which we can see right here. And so we just scroll down, you can see like all these different pieces are moving at different speeds, which is really, really awesome. Uh, and we can pull the code for that one up. I have it right here off screen. And so just looking, we can see that I'm all I'm really doing is this animation timeline of scroll. So I put animation, I give it a name. Uh, the animation is just transitioning stuff up and down. And I have a scroll on there and it, it works. <laughs> and so you can do link your animations to scroll without having to use JavaScript which is just really nice. Uh, and in this video, I sort of just scratched the surface of what we can do with it. I do have plans to do a much bigger deep dive on everything about it coming up at one point in the not too distant future. Now, as for support for this, it is only in Chrome right now and it's about 65% support. 
uh, although it is behind a flag in Firefox as well. And for me, for some reason, this is one of those features that doesn't seem to be getting enough attention yet, as I really think it's going to make a lot of really complex animations a heck of a lot easier. And getting, you know, these ones are only supported in Chrome and getting even more into the cutting edge, we have scoped CSS which just landed with Chrome 118 at the beginning of October. And scope has been something or a feature that people have wanted as part of CSS for a really long time now. And it's finally starting to become a reality. And scope's really interesting. And just as a really quick example here, if we take a look, uh, here we have a class of title, a class of title, and a class of title on all three of the headings here. And so if I came in and I said my title is color lime green for some reason, obviously they would all become lime green. But maybe you only want to affect the ones that are inside of an article and nothing else. Now, of course, we could say that this is my article and then choose my dot title that way. But we do have more options than that. So what we can do instead is here, I can do an at scope and we can say scope for my article. And then we're gonna select all of that and we're almost there, there we go. Uh, you can see that it is working and we're only selecting our titles that are inside of the article. But even more interesting than that is you can choose where your scope is starting and finishing. And all I have to do is here where I have my at scope, I can just write two and then I write where I want the scope to finish. So in this case, I want anything that's inside an article, but I don't want it to affect my email sign up. So I just say two email sign up. And by doing that, you can see that we've styled this one, but we're not selecting anything that's here. And let's just come and we'll copy this and we'll paste it down here. So we're still in my article. We'll close that paragraph off. And you can see this is still getting styled here. So we're staying, as long as we're inside the scope of the title, it's working. But if we reach an email signup, that styling won't actually bleed off and go into the email signup, but it will work anywhere else. So it's a really interesting thing that I think might look a little bit weird. It's going to take some proper planning to use it correctly, but it allows us to scope our styles to use them in specific areas. And I think it's going to be really powerful and something we start seeing more and more often once browser support for it starts to increase. Shifting gears a little bit, we have a, a simpler feature, which is user valid and user invalid. And these are two pseudo classes that have been supported by Firefox since 2021, but only landed in Safari back in May and in Chrome this month. Uh, which is November. They're actually very similar to valid and invalid, which you're probably already familiar with. Uh, but here's a very quick example where we just have this form element. And so because it's a type of email and there's nothing, that means it's invalid, which is really annoying. But as soon as I come in here, and let's just say I do like, I put in something, it's still saying it's invalid, which is correct. Uh, but as soon as we turn that into an at something.com, now it's a valid one. This one down here, instead of using the invalid, I'm using user invalid. And what that means is it's waiting for the user to interact with it before it decides whether it's actually invalid or not. And this makes so much more sense, right? So we have an email field. It's a required field. We need them to put an email address in. If I click in and click out, I haven't really interacted with it yet. I haven't done anything with that field. So it goes, okay, whatever, we're going to leave it. But as soon as we come in and we put in my email address and .com, well, it's completely fine. But if I stopped here, now it's saying that it's invalid. I've started to input something. I left the field. I didn't fill it out the way I needed it to. And we're getting the error there. And of course, this isn't perfect. You still want to be doing server-side validation and stuff. But you could even have it this checking uh, using regex and other things to make sure you're getting much better matches here or if you need passwords that have certain requirements and stuff. Just for a really simple inval like user invalid and styling it up that way. Uh, you know, that could be really helpful. But again, don't rely on this instead of server-side validation. This is just to make sure that you're getting through this first step and it just makes it so much easier to style and is so much better than using the invalid version. And one other new feature that I'm really, really looking forward to is the text box trim. And it also, it's text box trim and text box edge. And this is a really fun one, uh, even though it's supported by 0% of all browsers now, I thought it would be a good one to talk about. Uh, but first of all, because it's coming, it is in the Safari technical preview right now. And it's something that I've been waiting for for a really long time. This article here came out in 2020 to sort of talk about the idea behind it. Uh, Ethan Wine here has been championing this for a long time. Uh, and even I sat in on a meeting uh, with Ethan and some others as part of the working group that was going over the inline element spec, which this included. 
Uh, and it's something I really hope actually becomes a thing. And basically, if you come in and like select text, you know, there's like that extra space on the top and the bottom. And this can be really annoying. If you have a button and then you put padding on the top and bottom of the button, sometimes the padding on the top and bottom is not the same because when you have your text selected, the height of the text is different on the top and the bottom, right? And this really depends on, on the text itself. We'll probably see it even, look at all that extra space on the top. And there's not very much on the bottom when you take the descenders into account on this font. And it's different for every font too. Uh, the idea originally was going to be letting trim. From what I understand, that's now our text box trim and uh, text box edge, where we define the edge and then we can trim to that edge. Uh, and basically, it lets us like slice off that extra space. Uh, and there's a nice example here where you might have some a setup like this, and you have a gap of 32 pixels on your grid. But the problem is, because of that extra spacing, you actually end up with 39 on the top and 42 on the bottom, even though you wanted 32 on both, and you defined 32 on both, you got a lot more. With this feature, let's go away medium, with this feature, we're gonna be able to like slice off that extra, all, all these extra pieces of that text and just line things up exactly where we're gonna to want to. And it's something, like I said, that I've been waiting around for for so long now, and I'm happy to see a browser finally making some progress on it. And that was a really big update, and I'm sure I've missed out on a few things along the way here. So if there was a feature I didn't mention that you're really looking forward to and you'd like me to talk about in a future video, please leave a comment down below and let me know about it. Once again, if there was any features along the way that you're interested in, there should be a ton of links down below this video. And with that, I would like to thank my enablers of awesome Johnny, Tim, Simon, Andrew, and Web On Demand, as well as all of my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.